All right. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day. And today I will be talking about bugleweed versus antithyroid medication. So this will be a brief presentation. And then I'll, if there are questions, I'll answer a few questions. I can't stay on too long today because I actually have something else going on at one o'clock my time. But uh, I wasn't able to make an appearance last week, so I figured I'd make an appearance this week and once again talk about bugleweed and antithyroid medication. So many of you know that I personally dealt with grave disease. I was diagnosed in 2008 and I've been in remission since 2009 and you know, since then I've been working with a lot of people who have hyperthyroidism, Graves disease, and many of these people do choose to take antithyroid medication, such as methimazole, sometimes PTU, uh, carbimazole, some places uh, in different countries use carbimazole, which convert in, converts into methimazole. So I'm not, definitely not opposed to antithyroid medication, although when I dealt with Graves' disease, I personally did not take antithyroid medication. So I took the herb bugleweed, and I also took motherwort. I started out with bugleweed, and the bugleweed did help. I definitely noticed a difference in the resting heart rate and palpitations, but I was still experiencing some palpitations, and so I added motherwort. And uh, so... But there are a few different scenarios that I wanted to discuss to give you a better idea of, because I, I get questions all the time. Should I take bugleweed? Should I take methimazole or a different type of antithyroid medication? And it, it, it's, everyone's different. I, I, can't, I, I never tell anybody to take the medication or stop taking the medication. Uh, there are situations where, well, actually, that's not completely true. But, uh, well, let's let's dive into this. So, let's talk about a different scenario. So, scenario number one is someone is already taking antithyroid medication and they're doing fine and they're okay with staying on the medication. So, you know, of course, in this case, I will, you know, I'll encourage them to, you know, stay on the medication because they're doing fine with it and they're you know, the, the medication is, is, is working. I mean, that's the one thing about antithyroid medication is that it almost always is effective. The problem with antithyroid medication is that side effects are common. So if, if the person's feeling okay, if their liver enzymes are okay, if their white blood cell count is okay, then I'm certainly not going to talk them out of taking the medication. And again, I, I really, I, I never tell someone to stop taking a medication because if, if, it's, being prescribed by someone else. You know, I'm not a medical doctor, so I won't tell someone to stop taking a medication. And in this situation, I think it's probably a good idea for them to continue taking the antithyroid medication. And then, so scenario number two is someone who is taking the antithyroid medication and they're doing fine, but maybe they don't want to stay on the medication. And of course, nobody wants to stay on the medication medication is only taken temporarily to manage the symptoms. But if I have a patient that starts up care with me and they're on, let's say, methimazole and everything's going well, but they don't want to stay on the medication, once again, I'm not going to tell them to stop taking the medication. But if they want to make the transition to bugleweed, let's say, then what usually I'll do is I'll have them do both at the same time is uh, I'll, I'll, again, I'm not going to tell them to stop the medication, but I'll add the bugleweed. And then over time, they'll need to do blood tests. And, and the goal really is to not necessarily become hypothyroid because that's not a good thing either, but to kind of get their numbers towards the hypothyroid side. And then the prescribing doctor will typically reduce the dosage of the antithyroid medication. And then eventually the, the goal is to just be on the bugleweed. And then the goal is to not be on the bugleweed. So, so again, I, like I mentioned, I was diagnosed with Graves' disease late 2008. And so I, I took bugleweed and I took the motherwort. I was on both for, well, 
bugleweed a little bit longer because again i started that before the mother war but so i was on bugleweed for about nine months and i have not been on bugleweed since 2009 so i was on it for a while but i haven't taken it since then so um so nobody wants to stay on the medication and again you don't want to stay on the bugleweed either you want to get to the point where you don't need either one of these but there are some people that just absolutely don't want to be on the medication again you could argue that nobody wants to be on the medication which is true but but many people are actually okay with it they because they know it's risk versus benefits and the medication is you know preventing them from getting an arrhythmia or thought going into thyroid storm so so again that some people are perfectly fine taking the medication but th then there are those who, are, who fit under scenario number two who absolutely don't want to take a medication. And like I said, in that case, I can't tell them to stop taking a medication, but we could put them on bugleweed and then just that many times will help them get off the antithyroid medication sooner under the guidance of the prescribing doctor. Now, of course, there are some people who just take themselves off the medication or reduce the dose themselves. And that's, uh, again, I, I you know, I, I, of course I can't, control what the person does but all i'm saying is i never tell someone okay take the bugleweed and stop taking antithyroid medication so scenario number three is when someone is already taking antithyroid medication and they are experiencing side effects so again maybe they're taking methimazole and experiencing side effects and so when this is the case, once again, I'm not going to tell the person, oh, you're experiencing side effects, so you should stop taking the antithyroid medication. What I would do is I would tell them to go, you know, see the prescribing doctor. Usually it's an endocrinologist and just let the endocrinologist know. And, and now the downside, of course, is many endocrinologists will say, well, if you can't take the antithyroid medication, then you need to get radioactive iodine and thyroid sur or, or thyroid surgery, which isn't um always the case many most of the times it's not the case or other options so so another option of course another option is to take bugleweed which is what this discussion is bugleweed versus methimazole or bugleweed versus antithyroid medication but uh another option is to switch to a different type of antithyroid medication so if someone is on methimazole or carbimazole and they're getting some type of side effect. Let's say it could be a, it could be a symptom. So maybe they're experiencing, you know, a rash or dizziness or some other type of symptom. Again, maybe it's affecting their blood tests, the liver enzymes, the white blood cell count. So if this is the case, they could try switching to PTU. And, and some people absolutely don't want to do that because they might have read that PTU can put more stress on the liver, which is true in some cases. But there are people who don't do well on methimazole, but they do perfectly fine on carb. Uh, I'm sorry, they they do perfectly fine on PTU. So that at least is an option to consider, is to uh, consider a different type of antithyroid medication. But of course, there are natural approaches such as bugleweed, and there's also L-carnitine. I haven't spoken about L-carnitine yet here, but L-carnitine, when taken in higher doses, like 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams per day. That also has antithyroid properties. I do find the bugleweed to be more effective, but I, I'll add that it depends on the person. It depends on the the brand of bugleweed. Just not all herbs are the same. There's uh, different quality of herbs, different potencies. Uh, so if someone takes bugleweed and it doesn't seem to work, it could be just maybe it's not a good quality herb or could be lower potency. So a lot of people will take herb farm bugleweed or thyroid calming formula, uh, which has a one to five extract ratio. So it's good quality, but it's not high potency. So that's also something to consider. When I dealt with Gravesies, I took my, the bugleweed I took was a one to two extract. And, you know, therefore I commonly recommend that to my patients, but I'll have people who start working with me and they're already taking herb farm and they might be doing okay. So if there's someone's taking uh, herb farm, uh, bugleweed, then then that's great. Uh, then I mean, if, if they're taking the herb from bugleweed, let's say, and they're and it's doing a good job of managing the symptoms, that's great. If not, then we might need to switch them to a different bugleweed. So that's uh, another thing to consider. But if someone's taking antithyroid medication, experiencing side effects, then they it, it probably would be a good idea to check with your prescribing doctor and either switch to a different type of antithyroid medication 
or taking a natural approach. There, I'll add there's a few other options and you could check out my website, natural endocrine, natural endocrine solutions.com. And I have some articles on cholestyramine, which is not specifically for hyperthyroidism. Uh, it's used for uh, some cases, diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, also for toxic mold to bind to mycotoxins, but it could also bind to thyroid hormone. And I've had a very small sample size, only a few patients taking cholestyramine. Again, it does require a prescription, but that is another option is to, to be on the cholestyramine. And then low dose naltrexone or LDN uh, for those with Graves disease, that is another option. So if you have something like toxic multinodular goiter, then the LDN wouldn't be a good option because it's for the autoimmune component of not just Graves, but other autoimmune conditions. Problem with LDN, it is hit or miss. So LDN doesn't work in everybody. But again, it's it's something, just an, something else to consider. And if there's any questions on these, definitely let me know in the comments. So scenario number four, someone is hyperthyroid, uh, so, someone has hyperthyroidism and they're not doing anything to manage their symptoms. So they're not taking antithyroid medication. They're not taking herbs or not any other natural agents such as L-carnitine. So in this case, I will recommend them to consider taking bugleweed because if they're not doing anything, they're probably, now I, I might bring up the medication. I'm not saying I won't bring it up, but if they're not doing anything, many times they, they're not doing anything because they don't want to take the medication and, you know, assuming they are overtly hyperthyroid. If someone's like subclinical hyperthyroidism where TSH is uh, depressed, but thyroid hormone levels look good, that's a completely different scenario. But if someone is overtly hyperthyroid and they're not doing anything, it's usually because they don't want to take the medication and they either are unfamiliar with natural methods such as bugleweed and L-carnitine or uh, you know they maybe they're familiar but they just are cautious about self-treating themselves which i think is wise you want to be cautious about self-treating yourself um so in this case you know I'll, I'll bring up the different options but many times they'll want to take a natural approach and uh, you know in this situation of course i don't have to worry about them stopping the antithyroid medication because they're not taking antithyroid medication and so these are the main four scenarios I wanted to discuss. A fifth scenario might is if someone is already taking bugleweed, and if you know, I mean, there's other scenarios besides these. So someone is taking bugleweed, and let's say the bugleweed is working, then of course everything's great, and you know, stay on the bugleweed. You know, with all these scenarios, we want to address the underlying cause of the problem. So these are just ways of keeping safe while you're addressing the cause of the problem. So it's important for me to mention that. And uh, another scenario that I don't list here is if someone's taking bugleweed, but it's not working. And again, I mentioned earlier, it might be because that the quality of the herb isn't great, or it could be the potency isn't high enough. But let's say if they're taking good quality herb, potency is high enough. They've been on it for, you know, let's say a month or two, and it's not working. Many times you'll see changes before then, like with, I, I noticed, symptom wise within a few weeks. But again, let's say someone is given it longer, a month, two months, they're not feeling better. And then maybe on top of that, they, they do another thyroid panel and it's not improving or it's getting worse. Um, then in that situation, you probably would want to consider taking the, the medication or maybe cholestyramine, LDN, low dose naltrexone. So uh, yeah, so there's a, a, again, more than just these four scenarios. But that's really what I wanted to discuss. Every everything I'll add that everything comes down to risk versus benefits. So if I, I realize that there are some people that don't absolutely do not want to take the medication, but if it will prevent you from receiving radioactive iodine or thyroid surgery, then to me, like when I was dealing with Graves again, so I took bugleweed, but if I absolutely had to, I would have taken the medication. If it, let's say a month or two went by and there was no change in my symptoms and you know the blood testing wasn't improving and especially was getting worse, I would have considered to, you know, I would have considered taking the 
of the medication. So I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to the medication, um, not, not, not only my patients, but again, if there's a time and place and I would have resorted to the medication if I absolutely had to. But um, yeah, so I think that is all I wanted to cover. And um, again, I do have to leave a little bit early today, but if there are questions, I think there are some, some questions here. And so definitely post questions, but, um, and all right, we have Dr. Merritt, <laughs> Dr. Lisa Merritt. So uh, both of these herbs have been effective and it has less reactions than a medication. Yep, yeah, that is true. I mean, that's that's obvi that's obviously a big benefit of the herbs is that, you know, the herbs are, you know, they put less stress on the body. So the downside of the herbs is that they're not always effective. Like antithyroid medication is usually effective, uh, but it's more likely to cause side effects uh, than, you know, when compared to the herbs. So herbs less likely to cause side effects but might not work and, you know, and they don't work in everyone. But like I said, you also have to consider quality of the herb as well as the potency. But, um, but yeah, so thank you for, yeah, we're actually gonna be, yeah, so Dr. Merritt um, is actually my chiropractor. So, so she's also uh, poking in here and I'm actually gonna be interviewing her in a few weeks. We're gonna be talking about um, anti-aging and sleep. So, uh, and if anybody's in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, and you need a chiropractor, definitely check out Dr. Lisa, her practice, Weddington Wellness Chiropractic. So, and this wasn't this wasn't staged. She just uh, randomly uh, randomly popped up here. So, uh, even though I did recently contact her about interviewing her for um, for one of these uh, Facebook Lives in a few weeks, but uh, but I did not know she was going to make an appearance here. So. All right, we have Sandos here. How can you stop hair loss? So, so I, I've written a few articles on hair loss. Let me also put up my website here. So make sure you check out my website, naturalendocrinesolutions.com. And so you could, of course, do a search for hair loss. But I will also mention here that you know, hair loss, there could be a few different factors that result in hair loss. So one could be thyroid hormone imbalance. So with both hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. So very common with hyperthyroidism for people to experience hair loss. And sometimes it could be severe. So you definitely want to address the hair loss. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, you definitely want to address the hyperthyroidism. And even though you want to ultimately address the underlying cause, you you might you probably will need to do things to lower the thyroid hormone levels in the meantime like antithyroid medication or bugleweed or l-carnitine uh, so so that is one step now there are some people with hyperthyroidism who don't experience hair loss until they take antithyroid medication then it kind of swings their levels towards the hypothyroid side and and again they you know start experiencing hair loss and so, so balancing thyroid hormone is important. Uh, nutrient deficiencies can also be a big factor. So an iron deficiency, uh, you know, selenium, zinc, biotin. Uh, it's, you know, so, um, yeah, so numerous one or multiple nutrient deficiencies, imbalances in the sex hormones as well. Also getting back to nutrient deficiencies like fatty acids, especially uh, gamma linolenic acid which is in evening primrose oil, also borage oil. So, uh, so yeah, so those are some things that can um, help stop hair loss. And, and the good news usually with hyperthyroidism, as well as, you know, I have patients with hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's who lose hair, but, you know, the focus of this, this call is on hyperthyroidism since we're, we're discussing bugleweed and antithyroid medication. So, Good news, the hair loss almost always stops and grows back. The bad news, it almost always takes time for this to happen. But definitely visit my website and do a search and you'll see some articles on that. So, all right. So we got someone in the Facebook group asking, what about potassium iodide? I've read in high doses, it could be very effective in lowering thyroid hormones. That is true. So potassium iodide, so some people will take like iodorol, 
um, you know, Lugal solution to help. The problem is, so I, I'm definitely, you know, like um, I've had experience personally with high dose iodine, so I'm definitely not against iodine. Uh, and, you know, so again, I've had a good experience, but over the years I've realized that, you know, it's n not everybody does well with iodine. Uh, you know, sometimes it could even exacerbate the autoimmune response. There are people who I've known with, for example, thyroid eye disease who took higher doses of iodine and their thyroid eye disease got worse. Sometimes it could increase the antibodies. So yeah, so, and, and not everybody experiences negative side effects, uh, but because it is unpredictable, I don't tend to use potassium iodide as a way to manage symptoms. Now, you know, if someone is facing, you know, let's say if they've tried everything, if they tried, maybe they can't tolerate the antithyroid medication and the bugleweed's not helping. And, you know, I gave some other options too, but, you know, if they, let's say they've exhausted all possibilities and they're facing either the, you know, they're pretty much being pressured to get radioactive iodine thyroid surgery. Uh, and, you know, again, they've tried everything else that I would say, you know, potassium iodide is something to consider, but, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'll say with that. So again, like I said, I've had a good experience with iodine in the past. Um, and it could, it, it, it is, you know, another one I didn't mention is lithium lithium. I wrote an article on, I've also written some articles on iodine. So you can again, check out my website. All right, so what brand of bugleweed do you recommend? So I took Mediherb bugleweed when I was dealing with Graves' disease, and that, so that's what I commonly recommend. But again, like I said, there, there are other, there's not a lot of different brands of bugleweed just because bugleweed is more specific uh, for hyperthyroidism. So, uh, so again, it's not like vitamin D or selenium or fish oils where you see those everywhere. So there's only a few brands. Like I said, there are some people that take other brands like Herb Farm, and they do okay, but I, I typically recommend Mediherb. All right, give us a supplement for promoting hair regrowth. So like I was saying, uh, you know, so it depends on what's, there's no supplement that works in everybody. Um, there is, um, I forgot the name of the supplement. So one of the companies I like is Zymogen, and they do have uh, a supplement for hair, nails, um, hair and nails, I forgot. Um, Forgot what it's called, the regen, regen. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, th some silica is really good for helping. Um, but again, it's not the, it depends, like if someone is experiencing hair loss because of hyperthyroidism or even hypothyroidism, taking a supplement, a hair growth supplement isn't going to help. Same thing if someone has a nutrient, you know, if they have an iron deficiency that's causing hair loss, then they need to correct the iron deficiency. Maybe that's through taking iron. Maybe it's by increasing iron absorption. It depends on, you know, why are they experiencing, you know, how, well, it's also how, how deficient they are in iron, but then the cost of so someone is a cycling woman, they have a heavy menstrual flow, um, that could be a cause of iron. And maybe they do need to take a, an iron um, supplement. But if someone has like a gut issue, you would want to address the gut issue and not just to tell the person, okay, take iron indefinitely. All right. So can you explain the function of, um, so it should be the, yeah, so TRAB, I believe you mean, um, um, and uh, diagnosing graves and hyperthyroidism. So, so yeah, so TRAB or TSH, so TSH, it's not, not, not actually a hormone, it's um, antibodies. So T TRAB, TS TSH receptor antibodies, uh, those typically with, high, with Graves' disease, you'll have the person presenting with hyperthyroidism, which is depressed TSH, elevated thyroid hormone level, so T3, T4, and then they will, I, I usually recommend TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, which is the most common type of TRAB or TSH receptor antibody. So if, but either way, if someone has overt hyperthyroidism and they have elevated TSI and or TRAB, that typically is diagnostic of Graves' disease. Uh, if someone has, 
let's say a depressed TSH and T3, T4 look good, and they have elevated TSI and or TRAB, and that usually is subclinical, diagnosed as subclinical Graves disease. And um, but what happens is that the those antibodies, so the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, they they bind to or stimulate the TSH receptors, and that's what causes the excess production of thyroid hormone. So I hope that answers your question. Um, All right, so just got diagnosed with Graves and prescribed 2.5 milligrams of methimazole. I don't want the medication. Yeah, now I understand. So hopefully, I don't know if you, I mean, this is being recorded. So as soon as this is done, it'll be on Facebook. So if you missed the beginning, but these are the four scenarios I still have the, on the screen where there is a, so you would you would fall on the scenario number two where, you know, you're, or, or I don't know if you were taking the, actually, actually you might fall under scenario number um, four. Let me uh, hide this here. So where someone is hyperthyroid and, and maybe you're not on the methimazole yet. So again, you I, I can't tell you what to do, but if you're not doing anything, then you could consider taking antithyroid. Uh, I'm sorry, you could consider taking something like uh, bugleweed. I will say 2.5 milligrams is a very low dose of methimazole. So that's almost like a maintenance dose. So so I'm, I'm wondering if you just have a very mild case of Graves. And I, you know, I say that with a grain of salt just because, um, again, it's more of an immune system condition than a thyroid condition. And, and, you know, so even if the thyroid hormone levels are not crazy high, it's, it, you still have to go through the process of finding, removing triggers, you know, healing the gut. So it still will take some time to, to, you know, restore your health and, and get into remission, stay into remission. But yeah, it, it, you know, so 2.5 milligrams, it is a low dose, but I understand there are some people that don't want to take any medication. And, and again, I can't be critical since I didn't take medication when I dealt with Graves. But uh, as I mentioned, a lot of my patients do choose to take the medication and many are on, uh, most are on a lot more than two point, or I won't say a lot more, it depends. There are some people that are on you know, 40 milligrams to so the highest I've seen someone on is 60 milligrams of methimazole. That's rare, but, um, but I see people commonly on 10 to 20 milligrams. So again, 2.5 milligrams, very low dose. And, you know, you, you could consider bugleweed, for example, but um, of course that is up to you. All right, so another someone else from the Facebook group. Uh, so so those so this is being live streamed to it's one of my pages and then two of my groups. And so when it's in the groups, so, so you'll notice some people it shows their name, some people it doesn't. So if it's on my page, it shows if like someone's joining my page, it'll automatically show their name. If it's in the group, you have to give permission to show your name just because it's a private group. So just for privacy purposes. So, um, so, so I'll address to anyone who doesn't have a name as Facebook user <laughs> um, here. So this Facebook user mentions or asks, what are your thoughts on ashwagandha for hyperthyroidism graves? I heard that it exacerbates thyroid symptoms. Most of the time that's not the case, um, but it could, it could affect the HPT axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So uh, yeah, I, I, most most people do okay with ashwagandha. It's not something I give to everybody, but so there are times when I will give it to someone with hyperthyroidism, with Graves' disease, and most of the time there's no problem, but there is that possibility. Uh, when I was dealing with Graves, I took an herb called Eleuthera, which is also known as Siberian ginseng, and that also, like ashwagandha, sometimes can you know, make the person more hyper, uh, the, the good news is, I mean, it's not good when that happens, but the good news is when they stop it, you know, typically everything, you know, the, the hyperthyroidism, um, resolves. Um, but you know, uh, but yeah, so what, I, well, it doesn't resolve if someone's overtly hyper and they take it and it makes it worse, obviously they might still be hyper, but, but that's up to you as far as, you know, if you're uncomfortable taking ashwagandha. And like I said, I, I don't recommend it across the board. 
Uh, if someone has like high cortisol levels, ashwagandha could come in handy. And But there's other things too, like phosphatidylserine, for example, relora. Um, I really do like ashwagandha though. But yeah, that is that is one issue. Then another thing to mention is ashwagandha is a member of the nightshade family. So uh, if someone's trying to follow a strict AIP or autoimmune paleo diet, then they would want to avoid taking ashwagandha. Uh, but uh, like, yeah, so anyway, like I said, I like ashwagandha, also known as withania, but um, but yeah, it's not for everyone. And let's move on. So this uh, follow-up question. So I um, believe the person was taking 2.5 milligrams of methimazole. Yes, very mild case, minimal to no symptoms in mild labs. So yeah, yeah. So I would still... I would definitely still address the cause of the problem for a few reasons. One is, of course, the methimazole is not doing anything for the cause of the problem. Uh, number two, even though it's mild now, it could get worse, you know, over time. Or it might. What sometimes happens with mild cases is they'll get into remission. So the person you might take the maybe you choose to take the methimazole, and maybe a few months it seems like you're in remission, but then later on you relapse because the cause of the problem was never addressed. And then uh, another situation or another reason, a third reason to consider addressing underlying causes because you mentioned you were diagnosed with Graves' disease. So even if it's mild, someone with one autoimmune condition is more likely to develop other autoimmune conditions in the future. And this is the research. This is just me saying this. I actually have an article on my website. I think um, if you want to do a search, I think it's like multiple autoimmune syndrome, uh, but there is, it doesn't mean you will develop other autoimmune conditions. There's just a greater risk. Uh, and by addressing the autoimmune components and improving the health of the immune system there, that will greatly decrease the risk of developing other autoimmune conditions, as well as trying to get your grave disease into remission um, and keep it there, keep it into remission. So, you know, I've been in remission since again, 2009, I don't like to use the word cure. Some people ask, well, can it be cured? And the thing with Graves, there's what's called the triad of autoimmunity with the triad. So there's three factors necessary for autoimmunity to develop. And one is a genetic predisposition. Two is exposure to one or more environmental triggers. Three is an increase in intestinal permeability, also known as a leaky gut. But there is that genetic component. So that's why I don't use the word cure even though I feel like I've been cured since, again, it's been now like 2009, so about 12 years since I've been in remission. Um, but I, I, I just use the word or the term permanent remission, you know, and, and that's the goal. I, I mean, there's no guarantee I will stay in remission permanently. I, of course, hope I do. And that's my goal when working with other people with hyperthyroidism. But, um, but this... Uh, person asks, how do we know what the cause is? It's it's not easy. That's that's why I do recommend working with someone, working with a natural healthcare practitioner. And, you know, because most, most endocrinologists, just about all endocrinologists won't do anything for the cause. They're going to recommend one of three things, either antithyroid medication, radioactive iodine, or thyroid surgery. They're not going to do anything to address the cause. And if you bring up potential even if you talk about diet and the relationship between diet and hyperthyroidism, they're not going to, they're, they're, they're going to dismiss that pretty quickly. So I do recommend working with a natural healthcare practitioner. Um, I do see people with hyperthyroidism. I work with people not only throughout the United States, but, you know, overseas as well. Um, but there are others as well. You know, if you're interested in working with me, you can reach out to my staff person, Kate. Um, her email is staff at natural And, but, but again, there's, there's other practitioners. I will say that, you know, I also work with patients with Hashimoto's, but mostly I work with people with hyperthyroidism, like 80% of my clientele is people with hyperthyroidism graves, just because there are a lot more practitioners that who work with Hashimoto's and not a whole lot of natural, natural healthcare practitioners who work with hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, but um, uh, let's see. So how do we know the cause? Generic and family, no, uh, mom with Hashimoto's. Yeah, so I mean, genetics is a factor, but, you know, so 
again, when, when someone works with me, I of course do like a conference of health history, you know, recommend some testing. Uh, and again, if you're not familiar with my website, there's a lot of free information on my website, at naturalendocrinesolutions.com. And um, also have written a few books. So if you have hyperthyroidism, natural treatment solutions for hyperthyroidism, Graves disease, if you have Hashimoto's, I do have a book called Hashimoto's Triggers. But again, just even without the books, uh, a lot of a lot of articles on my website. All right. So congratulations on your remission, Dr. Osansky. I, I've had Graves and Hyper for the last 12 years, still taking my 10 milligrams of uh, thymazole daily. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So, well, thank you for the congratulations. And hopefully you could get to that. Just, uh, again, I, I wouldn't give up. You know, the the good news with Graves is that even if you've had it for a long time, it doesn't mean you can't get into remission. Now, Hashimoto's, it's, it's the same, but the problem with Hashimoto's is the longer you've had it, the more damage that could be done to the thyroid gland. So you could still restore the health of the immune system, but you might, like if someone's had Hashimoto's for 10, 15, 20 years, they're more likely to need thyroid hormone replacement and many times permanently, not, not all the time, but uh, with, with hyperthyroidism, Graves disease, that's not the case because you're not really getting damage to those, you know, TSH receptors, it's just really stimulating binding. So there's still hope you know, 10 milligrams, it's not a real high dose, but you know, it, it, it's, yeah. Um, usually like I, I consider like 2.5 to five milligrams more of like a maintenance dose, 10 milligrams still on the lower side. But again, you know, it's being that you've had it for so long, definitely want to, uh, dig deeper, you know, d uh, do more detective work and, you know, finding it, it's not always easy to find, find the trigger, removing the trigger, you know, uh, the correcting underlying imbalances. Okay. Yes, that's exactly what was recommended. So I assume you're mentioning, you're bringing up when I mentioned the three things the endocrinologist recommends, which is an for hyperthyroidism, antithyroid medication, uh, radioactive iron or thyroid surgery. That's, that's typically what they recommend. So, um, unfortunately, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm smiling just not because it's funny, but again, it's just like, it's predictable. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah, not a funny situation because again, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who get radioactive iodine thyroid surgery and they could have saved their thyroid. They didn't need the procedure. They just didn't know any better. You know, people, a lot of people just listen to what the medical doctor says, what the endocrinologist says. And the, the problem is that most endocrinologists agree. So some might not believe their endocrinologist. They might see their endocrinologist and then they go to another endocrinologist to ask for a second opinion. But just about all endocrinologists recommend the same thing. Now, some some might be more aggressive than others and just jump to the radioactive iodine thyroid surgery, whereas others will uh, be more conservative with the antithyroid medication. Uh, but, but either way, it's one of those three treatment methods. All right, I'm going to stay on another like seven minutes. Again, I got um, another call, not a call that I'm conducting, but actually something I'm attending at one. So uh, there's, I know there's a few more questions. So I should at least be able to get to these. So my primary run TSH, free T4, free T3, thyroid peroxidase, and thyroid globin antibodies all came in range, but I have horribly debilitating symptoms. I'm scheduled for a thyroid ultrasound with an endocrinologist next week. Is there any test they miss? What should I expect from ultrasound? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it might not be thyroid. So I guess it, it's hard uh, through Facebook also just because like the numbers might be within range, but they also might not be optimal or may, maybe they are optimal, but that's a possibility too. So Things might be within the lab range. So the doctors are saying everything looks good, but might be out. So like, for example, you know, if someone, someone might have a TSH that's like 3.5, which is within most lab ranges, but it's not, it's outside of the optimal range. 
And, you know, if someone's dealing with hyperthyroidism, you would want to add, or if they're feeling hyper, then you'd want to do the TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. Um, but yeah, I, I, as far as the, the ultrasound, um, I don't know what to expect because everything looks good. But as I mentioned, there could be things out of balance uh, or out of, out of the optimal range, but just within the lab range. Um, so the only way to know, of course, is to see what the ultrasound shows. It might look perfectly fine. And, you know, if it looks perfectly fine and if everything is within optimal, then you might need to look into other things. So, I mean, I definitely would recommend the basics. So like C CBC, complete blood count with differential, conference and metabolic panel, lipid panel, CRP, which is C-reactive protein, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Um, you know, I usually recommend a full iron panel, homocysteine. I mean, there's a, a, a lot, you know, a number of different tests that I, that I recommend. And, um, you know, yeah, so it's hard to say what, you know, those are some of the more general tests, but if everything comes back negative, then of course more detective work will be done or will should be done um, to see why you're having those horribly debilitating symptoms. Uh, again, maybe it's related to thyroid um, and it's just, you know, within lab range, but not optimal, maybe something else, you know, it could be something else. So that's, um, yeah, that's why it's a good idea. I, I don't know if you're working with, it sounds like you might be working just with, uh, I mean, you said endocrinologist here, so you, you might eventually need to work with a natural healthcare practitioner. And again, that doesn't mean me, that just means it might be someone locally or maybe someone else that you work with remote, remotely. But what many times will happen and probably will happen if everything comes back negative, the endocrinologist will, pro will probably rule, um, refer you out. So if the everything is within the range according to the endocrinologist, and the ultrasound looks good, they very well might refer, depending on what other symptoms you're having, they might refer you to a rheumatologist or you know another type of specialist. And again, many times they just are unable to find the cause of the problem. You know, so another story quickly, and I'll get to this other question, and that probably will be the last question I get to. Um, but 2018, three years ago, I was feeling pretty good. That three years ago from now, but then a month later in July of 2018, I started getting neurological symptoms and, you know, I was getting some numbness in the face and eventually weakness in, in one of my legs and getting some other neurological symptoms. And I was thinking Lyme or multiple sclerosis, but I was leaning towards Lyme just because the experience I've had with others who had Lyme. But so I went to a primary care doctor and he, he didn't even want to do a Lyme test. Uh, he wanted to refer me to a neurologist. And thankfully I didn't listen, <laughs> just listen to my own instincts and didn't, go, I figured, you know, I could always go to neurologist later, but if it was Lyme, I wanted to get that addressed. And sure enough, I went to a, a functional medicine practitioner who focuses on Lyme um, and a female practitioner who actually dealt with Lyme. And um, sure enough, I had, you know, I, I tested positive for chronic Lyme. And um, yeah, so again, sometimes people are referred to, from specialist to specialist and the problem is never found. I'm not saying that would be the case with you. I'm just telling you if, you know, if the endocrinologist refers you to someone else, I'm not saying not to go to that referring doctor, but just be aware um, that uh, sometimes that is the case where they can't find um, the problem and they, um, they're not looking for underlying causes and they're not going to refer you to a natural healthcare practitioner. Okay, well, goiter go down when levels are normal or does the next day enlarge? It depends on how large the goiter is. So I've had a lot of success with goiters and getting them um, decreased. There's actually a uh, blog post I wrote not too long ago on thyroid swelling. So if you visit my website, naturalendocrinesolutions.com and do a search, as little search bars, do a search for thyroid swelling. I talk about that. Um, if it's really large, it, you might still be able to shrink it, but it might not go back to where it was previously. All right, um, actually I'll answer one more question. I said, I'll go into like 1245 and it's 1244. So um, can Graves play up with calcium when active? I have primary hyperparathyroidism along with Graves and calcium went down when Graves was under control. Yeah, so that I'm actually, I'm. I'm working with, I have worked with other patients, but one comes to mind where 
her calcium is actually really high and um, everything like the PTH test for parathyroid hormone looks good. Um, so it's, you know, she's been to other doctors that's, it doesn't seem like she has hyperparathyroidism, but yeah, that having just hyperthyroidism can sometimes drive up those calcium levels. And so that sounds like that's the case with you. Calcium went down when Graves was under control. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely is a possibility. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and, um, yeah, again, sorry that I didn't go as usually I try to go a, a full hour, but like I said, normally I, I do these at two o'clock, but I also did it earlier than normal just because I have something else that I'll be attending in, in 15 minutes. So, uh, but I will be on next week. I'm not a hundred percent sure what time I think it'll be the normal two o'clock is, is what, what, what I'm thinking right now, but I, I'll definitely post in the, on Facebook, uh, with uh, a day or two before. And, um, and yeah, you are very welcome and again. Thank you. Thanks everyone for, uh, for tuning in and for your questions. I really do appreciate it and, uh, hope everyone has, a awesome rest of their day and a great weekend ahead. All right. Take care, everyone.